During World War I, a number of camps were constructed throughout the United Kingdom in order to train the young men who had enlisted to fight for their country. Among these camps was a long-forgotten part of history of the local area, Shoreham Army Camp. The Shoreham Army Camp was built in and around the area of Buckingham Park. Now most of it is buried beneath the A27 and privately owned farmland. The project of discovering more about the camp and the men who were trained there is crucial to remembering history and the story of the many soldiers that fought for our freedom. We began our initial research in the small area of where the camp used to be. Justin Russell from Archaeology South East was on hand, as well as Luke Barber from the Sussex Archaeology Society to guide us through the process of marking grids and sweeping the area with metal detectors. During the morning of metal detecting, we found construction materials, such as nails, a window latch that would have been a part of one of the huts, as well as metal hoops from soldiers' rucksacks and a button that was later confirmed to be from a South African soldier's uniform, offering us the information that South African soldiers were also based at Shoreham for some time. After finding the interesting artefacts during the metal detecting at Slonk Hill, we decided to look more into the camp itself and some of the soldiers that were based there for training. At first, we visited Worthing Museum and the local library to see if there were any specific details about the camp, but also about the First World War itself. At the museum, we saw some of the posters that would have been placed around Shoreham and Worthing in order to encourage men to volunteer for the army. Well, but the first thing that struck me was the detail. Now, you found buttons at Slonk Hill, but those were for, like, shirt buttons or for greatcoat buttons. This is for the distressed tuning here. You can actually see it's got the insignia of the Royal Sussex Regiment on there as well. This led us to begin thinking about what the locals of Shoreham knew about the First World War and the camp that was based in their local area. We also learned about the changes that happened to the economy of Shoreham and Brighton by having thousands of soldiers living and spending money there, making it the town that we see today. After learning new information about the camp and the local area surrounding it, we began to conduct interviews with the general public about what they knew some of which even gave us more information about the history of the local area that we didn't know ourselves. Have you ever heard of the Shoreham Army Camp? No. No? no. Oh. oh, was that in Buckingham Park? Yes, it was. Buckingham? Yeah. I'm sorry, World I've never War. heard of it. Ah, <laughs> yeah. I think they also had the same during the First World War. Yeah, it was the First yes. World War and Second World War. And it was... Lots of tents. Yeah, there were thousands of soldiers that came to Shoreham right. and it's kind of made the town how it is. How, where did you hear of the Shoreham Army Camp? Um... Local history, just local reading history. local history books. Oh, okay, brilliant. All um, I knew was the Green Jackets pub, which was there, which was much further back in the mm. Napoleonic times, I think, where the Green Jacket regiments oh, okay. were based there, yeah. which was a military regiment. Oh. And that's what the pub was called, but that's yeah. about 200 years ago. Yeah, back, yeah. So. But no. Oh, so you, are you generally interested in history as a general public? Sort of? We are, yeah. 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 Yes. Have you ever heard of the Shuramami camp? Yeah. Yeah? Um, where from? Do you know? Just where? locally in the papers and things. Just yep. locally. Um, do you know much about it? Not really, no. Not really. Um, are you interested in learning more? Yeah, because I'm ex military. I was in the Royal Navy oh, for brilliant. 22 years. Oh, wow, that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, are you interested in history then? Yes. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard of the Good Child Brothers? No. We even visited the church of St. Mary de Ora. That would likely have been somewhere that some of the soldiers based at Shoreham may have visited. Whilst there, we found that there was a remembrance plaque for all of the men that volunteered for the war and trained at the Shoreham Army Camp. Oh, um, so you haven't heard of the Shoreham Army Camp then? No. no? Um, are you interested in it? Um, no. <laughs> no, really. Okay. <laughs> um, are you interested in history? No. No. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the Goodchild Brothers? No. Among the soldiers from Kitchener's New Army that were sent to train in Shoreham were two of the Goodchild brothers, Arthur Goodchild and his elder brother Edmund. Both brothers are from the village Grunsborough, located in East Suffolk, and it is thought that they would have worked as labourers within the village before volunteering and joining the 9th Battalion Suffolk Regiment. Arthur, the youngest of the brothers, enlisted 14 months under the minimum age of September 15th, 1914. Along with being underage, he also suffered from impaired hearing since childhood, making his time at Shoreham slightly harder in comparison to the other soldiers. Between them, Arthur and Ned tell a lot to their mother of the camp at Shoreham, giving us a small insight into what it was like to live and train at the Shoreham Army Camp. We are up here high and can see miles out of the sea and nearly all over Brighton. This is a small but pretty town. Its biggest part of low bedroom houses painted red and white. 
We go down to the seaside and bathe sometimes. We are intense down here. There is about 15,000 of us, 16 in each tent. Initially, the soldiers were camped on Slonk Hill, but with a couple of weeks had moved to Buckingham Park. Ned's first impression of Shoreham was that It is no bigger than Woodbridge, and we can hardly move for soldiers. And there is 10,000 more to come. Tents look to reach miles out. In comparison to Arthur, Ned spoke about the conditions in more detail, reporting that They have got floors for tents, but we are getting rain here now. There is plenty of slush here now. Two weeks later... Anyone wants the best of health to stand in this tent now. Whereas, Arthur chose to write about the amount of food they were supplied, seemingly to calm his mother about how they were keeping. There's 14 in our tent now, and we have 7 loaves of bread a day, plenty of cheese, butter and jam. We have hot sausages for breakfast, sometimes bacon. We have hot beef and potatoes for dinner. We have not had a cold dinner only once. And that was when that was when we came from Ispich. We had some good cake last Sunday for tea, and I have always have the tea I can drink. I never buy no food in the town of a night, but I have some before I go to bed and one I wake up to. As the condition in the tents worsened, the brothers both spoke of the huts being built with the soldiers, which was seemingly never going to be finished. I don't think we shall ever go in these huts. However, it was reported by Ned on December the 1st, 1914, that they had finally been placed into the huts. It wasn't long, though, before the weather conditions had gotten so bad that the 9th Battalion Suffolk Regiment were moved to Brighton. Ned was billeted into the comforts of 17 Crescent Road, Ditchling Road, and Arthur into 78 Rose Hill Terrace, London Road. We have moved to Brighton. We came by train from Shoreham. Ned is here, too. Brighton indeed seemed to have brightened the brothers' mood slightly, as they were now somewhere clean and dry, that had much more in terms of entertainment than the small town of Shoreham. A very nice house. Anything we like in the food line, three of us. We have a nice bedroom to ourselves, chest of drawers for our clothes. Not so much mud here as at Shoreham. We can walk about clean and dry. He got moved to the 3rd Battalion due to only being fit for home service. This move was made due to Arthur's struggle with his impaired hearing during training, which was slowly being noticed by other soldiers and his officers. This was decided after he attended numerous hospital visits regarding his hearing. The move was well received from his mother, as there was now less worry about him being shipped to the front line. However, Arthur was disheartened to be leaving a young girl he had fallen heavily for in Brighton, Dolly. After being at Felixstowe on the 27th of July 1915, Arthur was shipped to France to join the 1st Battalion in order to experience life in the front lines. After a week, the 1st Battalion was shipped towards Egypt and then Salonika. He remained in Salonika for five months before suffering an injury and arriving back in England late June 1916. Being placed in 2nd Eastern General Hospital in Brighton, happily being close to Dolly once more. Dolly is coming to see me Sunday afternoon. However, nothing more is known of Dolly after this. Arthur's letters stopped in July 1916 when he returned home. Ned's story is vastly different to his younger brother's, resulting in his unfortunate death. Towards the end of June 1915, the battalion left Shoreham, marching towards Blackdown Camp near Farnborough. After leaving Blackdown Camp, Ned and the 9th Battalion were moved to Elite, where they were moved to farm buildings where he undoubtedly found a likeness to the French countryside in comparison to that of Suffolk. I and Sutton are both writing together in the orchard, in the shade of an old apple tree. The trees are full of apples, and there are some trees nearly smothered with mistletoe. The berries are just showing themselves, and look as if there will be plenty of Xmas here. After he wrote what was one of the longest letters, he marched to the Battle of Luz. After surviving the Battle of Lewes considerably, the largest offence from British soldiers, the battalion spent the last two months of 1915 in Belgium. Ned's last letter to his mother was written on the 15th of December, which closed with... Wishing you all every success for a Merry Christmas and a prosperous Happy New Year. On the 19th of December 1915, Ned was killed in a gas attack by the Germans in the trenches. His commanding officer wrote to his mother the day after his death. Dear Mrs. Goodchild, I deeply regret it's my duty to write and inform you that your brave son was killed in action early yesterday morning. 
It grieves me greatly to have to write the sad news, and I hope it will be a little consolation to know that he died bravely under most trying circumstances. It was during a gas attack, and he was killed by a shell while acting as a guard on a barricade in a little village. The same shell killed the officer of his platoon. He was buried last night by a chaplain and rests in a little village in a graveyard for a regiment outside of Ups. I sympathise most deeply with you in your sad loss, and to me he is also a great loss, being one of my best and bravest soldiers. He died with his rifle by him ready for the enemy. No man can do no more. He was very sincerely, Seymour W. Church. Thank you.